Hello, I'm Aldis Galukas, and it's my pleasure to welcome one and all to the seventh in our free monthly virtual What Talk series. For those new, WHAT stands for Waterside Hypotheses slash Aquatic Theories, or whatever you like. In a nutshell, they propose that the significant differences between humans and chimpanzees are most plausibly explained by a more aquatic past in our evolution. This is still admittedly a minority view in the field of biological anthropology. But although its unpopularity frustrates the hell out of me, uh, it remains my long held opinion that these ideas are probably the most powerful since uh, Darwin and Wallace gave us the brilliant ideas of natural selection pertaining to human evolution. It's not the number of actual proponents that it should impress people, but the number of different fields from which individual thinkers all seem to have come to similar conclusions converging on a common waterside theme. Already in this series, we've heard from Simon Bearder, a primatologist, Stephen Munro from the Australian National Museum, Mark Verhagen, a general practitioner, Stephen Cunane, a nutritional scientist specialising in brain chemistry, and Michel Odon, an obstetrician. Still to come in our forthcoming series, we have Erica Shagatai, a diving physiologist, uh, Peter Rees Evans, an ear, nose and throat specialist, Michael Crawford, another nutritional scientist specialising in brain growth, and Kathleen Stewart, a paleontologist. These experts are all from diverse fields and backgrounds, but all of them are in agreement that the strange human condition was most likely the result of a more aquatic past. It is with this backdrop in mind that it gives me great pleasure to welcome this month's guest speaker. Chris Knight was for many years Professor of Anthropology at the University of East London. His research uh, for decades has been focused on the origin of these peculiar, uh, on the origins of human culture and language, exploring the idea that these peculiar phenomena were not the result of a gradual evolution, but of a process culminating in a kind of revolutionary change. He was the founder, founding member of the Radical Anthropology Group, which regularly meets to discuss these and other aspects of the human condition. I was at UCL in London around the turn of the millennium when I used to attend these meetings myself, and I heard Chris lecture for the first of many times. If today's talk is anything like those, I know it will be brilliant and enthralling. So, like all of our speakers so far, Chris brings something quite unique to the table. Different, but as with the others, his ideas are again consistent with a waterside, waterside theme. I strongly recommend his first book, Blood Relations, and for me, it's especially excellent seventh chapter, The Shores of Eden, to read how this connection works in detail. But we are lucky to have Chris here with us uh, today uh, to summarize these ideas for us. He's written many other works, of course, notably Decoding Chomsky, a critique of the famous linguist and political activist. Chris has also co-edited several volumes on the origin of language. Please see this talks page on our What Talks website for a potted biography of Chris and links to his blog where a full set of references to his work can be found. Okay, so enough of me. As usual, please make sure you stay on mute for the duration of the talk until the end where there should be time for questions and discussion. Now, with it, without further delay, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Chris Knight. Very, very glad indeed to have um, found this uh, wonderful group uh, and of course I've been following most of the most of the talks. Um, so uh, okay um, when we have uh, when we have a discussion I mean by all means ask me about 
all the kind of difference in time I've been interested in. So uh, I'm kind of, kind of well known for my book, um, Blood Relations, Menstruation and the Origins of Culture. Uh, and that has a lot of menstruation in it, which, which is, of course, breaking a taboo. And one of the topics is um, menstrual synchrony. And that, and that involves the length of the menstrual cycle and the, and the possible connection with the lunar cycle, which then goes into a possible connection with tidal rhythms. Um, and more recently, I've been heavily involved in, in working on the origin of language. So I co-founded Evolang with Jim Herford, my colleague up in Edinburgh, and Evolang became from 1996 onwards kind of the main international conference organization for interdisciplinary collaboration on that hugely complex topic the emergence of language so i'm just saying you know by all means if if you're interested in those topics um please ask me um but now i'm i'm specifically focusing focusing on one issue um which is why it is that so many um stories about human origins um, kind of leave out the female and of course we can think of all kinds of sort of standard ideological and political reasons why that might be so but i'm i'm especially interested in how that whole topic of the relevance of either gender to the emergence of human anatomy initially and, and physiology and, and brain size and eventually symbolic culture including language um, what I'm interested in is how that relates to the, the, the kind of why the ecological context of whom, human um, evolution. So let me just start by saying this. Um, it's, it's the standard behavioral ecological line. I mean, basically anyone who studies mammals or primates um, as social creatures with, with, with strategies will tell you that female strategies drive evolution. Um, so with mammals in general, it's what the females do uh, that counts initially. And the same, of course, applies within um, uh, mammals to primates in particular. And then let me just say the reason for that. The reason is that, of course, environmental changes, um, ecological factors drive evolution in a general sense. But what happens is that because females are primarily interested, much less in sex, um, than in their babies, it's the females who move first. So supposing that the climate has changed and, and the vegetation is more sparse, well, it, the, 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 as the females disperse more widely to find food and perhaps get a bit territorial, keep, it, keep one another out of their kind of cabbage patch, or supposing the food which is available is no longer so much in the trees, but is more on the ground, the, 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 the creatures, the primates will, will, will change their strategy, but it's the females who've you change their strategy initially. And that's because, of course, for males, the main thing isn't food. For males, the primary consideration is reproduction through finding a sexual partner. So what happens is that whatever the females are doing is primary, and they may be um, in the trees, on the ground, they may be dispersed or aggregated in clumps. Um, but what happens is the males then map onto what the females are doing. And that means that overall, uh, females drive evolution, and, and that applies to all primates. So you might expect that given that we are primates, we are of course great apes, that the same um, scientists that know all this, and by the way, let me just say Richard Wrangham is the pioneer in explaining all this in, in, in 1980, the, the idea that females drive primate evolution. It was Richard Wrangham was the kind of first primatologist to really establish this, and then it became it just became accepted, uh, you know, but okay, so it, it applies to all primates, including us, the, these particular great apes that we are, with one exception, humans. Apparently, when it comes to human evolution, um, you look at the males, and of course you have all the various versions of it, man the hunter, man the toolmaker, man the thinker, man, you know, all these different things, and the females kind of tag along. So you might ask, well, how is it that they justify that? How is it that they can justify suddenly switching round such a fundamental, basic, generalized principle that females drive evolution? How is it that when it comes to humans, it suddenly turns around and all the rules are broken and it's, it's the males that drive evolution? Well, of course, and I'll show, I'll just, I'll show a couple of articles if we get to the PowerPoint, a particular one by, by Clive Gamble and Robert Foley, very, very, very senior evolutionary theorists 
Um, and then what they say is, well, of course, that is the way around it is. It's the females that move first. You have a kind of cascade, of course, causality. The, the climate changes, the distribution of vegetation changes or other gatherable resources, that, the patterns of dispersal and aggregation of, 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 you know, then reflects that, but it's the females whose patterns are primary. Then, of course, finally, as, the, as kind of the, the, the last stage of this cascade, cascade of causes, the males map onto what the females are doing. But they say, of course, what happens with humans is that although the distribution of resources is primary, males, control the distribution of resources suddenly. And why is that? Well, because if you take it that um, we began in the forests six million, eight million years ago, and then, and then moved out to a different kind of environment and from the forest went onto the hot, dry savanna, there's not a lot of food out there. And what food that is available, the males are gonna have to get because of course you need these essential fats, these lipids, these brain selected nutrients that we, we all know so much about. And how are you gonna get those? Well, there's not much out there really, but on the other hand, if you scavenge for animals and you, or you find their bones and you crack open the skull or crack open the bones and get the marrow, uh, there you are, you've done it. But I mean, are females going to be doing that kind of thing? Are females with their babies going to be either scavenging for meat or killing the animals and, and then cracking open the skulls and all that stuff? Well, clearly that's not too convenient if you're a female with your babies. And then even if you manage to do it, I suppose there's no reason why you're Females shouldn't manage to do it, but that it's not going to be all that easy. And so, insofar as it's going to be primarily male activity, males now control these absolutely essential food resources. And therefore, although that although it's true that the distribution of resources um, causes kind of pretty much else that happens in evolution, males now control the distribution of resources, and that justifies switching your paradigm from a, a female-driven paradigm to essentially male one. So of course, uh, long ago in my book, um, Blood Relations in 1991, I kind of realized that that is complete nonsense because there's absolutely no reason why as you come out of the forest, the first thing you're gonna do is move out into hot, dry savanna. There's so many, so many alternatives, all the wetlands, all the marshes, all the, you know, the riverside environments with en enormously rich resources. Um, and so, as soon as we look at it, things that way around, of course, there's no earthly reason why that fundamental principle shouldn't be generalized to include humans as well, which, which means that humans are no longer this, this exception to all the, all the rules of, of fundamental behavioral um, ecology. So now, as soon as we look at um, primates, and, and I, I, perhaps I should perhaps sort of introduce some of this by saying that I, I was I was close to Elaine Morgan. I invited her to many of our conferences. We, we had this thing called Human Evolution Interdisciplinary Research, and um, and we got on very well. But I always noticed that Elaine kind of she her, her her picture of how Darwinian natural selection works is that you have a body, the individual body, and you have its environment, and the environment kind of ends up shaping. Um, the body and the social dynamics just aren't there and, and of course i'm aware that elaine's first book was called the descent of woman and she kind of identified as a feminist and she had one or two things about you know, specific features of the female body compared with other apes um, you know less fur than males and um, hymen various things but, but I, i'm sure you, all of you are aware of this the the the, the, the revolution in the life sciences that, that was so spectacular during the late 60s, 70s and 80s, largely consequent on the idea that group selection didn't work and that selection acts at the individual level. So, um, of course, Dawkins self as gene, but for me, more interestingly, John Maynard Smith and others who look at using game theory, that, that revolution focused fundamentally on social dynamics. Are these animals cooperating or are they competing? Is it a bit of both? Are these animals competing to cooperate, cooperating to compete? All those fundamental issues initially, of course, got labeled um, sociobiology because of all the hullabaloo and all the ways in which the poor sociobiologists got harangued and attacked uh, for this and that. They changed their, their label and called themselves behavioral ecologists. No, we don't do sociobiology, we're behavioral ecologists. And you know, they just had, they had to do that to sort of avoid all the horrendous cat call naming they, 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 they suffered from, from. But anyway, so the critical thing I'm trying to point out is that it's all about social dynamics, social strategies. And so it's interesting to look at those among other great apes. 
and I won't go into it, I'm sure most of you know a lot about it, but fundamentally with, with common chimps, uh, okay, when we first began to learn about uh, chimps um, uh, in, in Gombe Stream, Jane Goodall's work, and, and Richard Rangham, of course, is a student of Jane Goodall, the, um, the resources are pretty scant. It's a pretty miserable sort of forest area. There's not much food to go around. The females, uh, you know, get quite territorial about their particular kind of cabbage patch. Each female is pretty jealously defending her own little area. If a neighboring female enters, the, the resident female will attack her. And there are plenty of examples of killing her infant as, as, a, as a result of that. So quite a lot of infanticide. And, and because the females, aren't in a rich enough, a resource, a sufficiently resource rich environment, they, they disperse. And, um, and, 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 and as a result of that, they don't form alliances while foraging. And that means, of course, that there's a kind of power vacuum into which step the males. So you get a, you get, you get a kind of, you get a, bun a bunch of males, sort of kin related males, patrolling the boundaries of their wider um, territory, in which are um, smaller territories controlled by relatively isolated females. Now, we're now talking about the eastern part of the range of Central Africa where the chimpanzees um, exist. And the male dominance is very extreme. Every single male dominates every single female. Um, no matter the very variability in muscular strength or size doesn't really count. As I say, it's a kind of universal feature that males dominate females. And uh, it's more than just domination. It really is quite savage. Um, and um, females, uh, uh, they need to move out, of course, uh, to avoid incest uh, on, on becoming sexually mature. And um, if they stay in, in their own area, there's, a, there's a quite a substantial danger of um, sexual harassment from relatives, including older brothers. Um, and so they, they, they need to get the hell out of there, uh, into, some, into the other territory, but, and there, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, they're likely to be attacked by the resident females as well as um, males in that territory into which they've moved. So it's pretty, um, pretty difficult for females. And of course, what does happen as well, we know from Jane Goodall's work and others, others' work, is that rather rarely, maybe, I don't know, one in five females in that area, a female would choose to stay with mum. And although that means a li some risk of, um, of, of harassment from relatives, when they do stay with mum, um, they do far better, and, um, and I'm sure some of you know about this. But I mean, this kind of world record holding, holding um, female who with, with, became a sort of head, a matriarchal head, really, of a of a line of of of, of females, uh, because she, because she lived with her mum, and then her daughters lived with their mum, which is the exception to the rule. It just shows that for a, for a chimpanzee female living with mum, when you get some support from relatives, is a lot better than moving out. Where you haven't got any kin and ha haven't got any relatives, but of course moving out is necessary if, if in the course of living with mum, you're you're subjected to harassment by uh, resident males. Point I want to make is that as you move from the eastern area of the chimpanzee range in Central Africa further and further west, you might arrive at the Thai forest, um, and there resources are much more abundant, and the females, because resources are more abundant, the females can afford to forage. Um, together, you may get a, a, a group of females foraging um, simultaneously with each other, um, and then, of course, they because they forage together, they form relationships with each other. And when they form form relationships with each other, they're much more able to fight back against male dominance. And indeed, there's much less severe male dominance in the western part of that chimpanzee range, and then in the eastern part, thanks to the re um, richness of resources. Okay, so about a million years ago, we are now told, one particular group of <laughs> common chimps um, managed to cross the Congo to the south. And that must have been when the Congo River was had pretty much dried up. There must have been one particular point where these hydrophobic chimps, chimpanzees, as you all know, they can't stand water, they, they drown pretty quickly, uh, but there must have been sufficiently um, you know, uh, dry at that point, the river, for them to cross over to the southern side. And those particular chimps, about a million years ago, and the geologists can work out roughly when it is, and it seems to be there was two times where it might have happened to, around two million years ago, and then around one million years ago, and it seems the one million years ago date is more likely, which means that, by the way, the bonobos have only diverged from chimps that very short amount of time, about a million years, but having crossed the river, 
they found a paradise <laughs> because south of the Congo, there were these rivers, wetlands, lakes, marshlands, absolute extraordinary abundance of food. And these chimps who previously been hydrophobic, they just had to get used to the water. And of course had a large amount of food, including of course, all the things which Michael Crawford and Stephen Conane have been telling us about, the, you know, the lipids, the fats, the, you know, with all the shellfish and all the other stuff you'd, and, and lily bulbs and all the, all the you know, the, the minerals and so on, which you'd expect to find either on the edges of lakes or in, on this particular area, which is not so much, not, not so much lakes, but are pretty, you know, wide tributaries of the, of the Congo. Um, and then, of course, what happens to those um, chimps is like extending that logic. The, the richer the resources, the more females can, can forage in, in each other's company. And what happened to the, here is that multiple females could forage with each other, much more tolerant of each other's existence because there's plenty of food to go around. And then these females had enormous leverage against males. And I'm sure you all know this, and this, but this is only, this, only kind of widely recognized about what, 15, 20 years ago, it's in, in some ways extraordinarily, bonobos are matriarchal. They're not patriarchal. The females, if any, if either sex is dominant, it's most definitely the females. In fact, there's now there's a, a lot of work on this. And, and what's kind of almost comical, really, is that they're not just dominated by females, they're infant dominated. So there's this lovely theory called the um, offspring defense hypothesis, worked out by Brian Hare and his colleagues, um, which, is, which is that if a, if a male looks at a a, a, a youngster in the wrong way, like it could be a bit of a threat, like might take his food, for example, then he will be attacked by several females, the mother and her friends. And so, <laughs> and so there's these examples of, um, um, for, in, in, of course, while living uh, bonobos south of, the, south of the Congo River, a, 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 a huge fruit drops from a tree and this huge male bonobo starts to tuck into it. Um, and then he notices um, a, a little infant, like a, a one-year-old, and um, he, he, he sort of he, he reaches back because he just knows he shouldn't be doing that. Because he could, and what's going to happen if if that male, or, or supposing the, supposing the male when he finds this fruit is a little infant look, going towards it, wanting to eat it, the male would be um, terrified because if that if that infant should cry then he's for it because the mother who will be watching at, at all times with her allies with her female allies will come down like a ton of bricks on that male and so you actually get almost ruled by kids ruled by infants among wild living bonobos quite extraordinary so i mean that's really my theme that's the essence of my talk this afternoon is simply that if you assume a savannah hypothesis you've got male dominance all the way down which is in contradiction to the to the usual logic of primate evolution, and and you can only retain that normal logic if you like that female strategies drive evolution, if you assume a completely different scenario where moving from the forest uh, involved not going into hot dry savanna but moving into what would have been sort of mixed waterside environment. Uh, you can call it savanna mosaic. I don't really mind calling it savanna if people want to, as long as savanna includes wetlands, marshes, riverbanks, and the rest of it. And I should just say, of course, again, I'm sure most of you know this, that's precisely what Richard Wrangham does. He, he, he acknowledges um, that um, bipedalism, can, it only makes sense to think that our, our ancestors became bipedal by wading in, in, in water. Nothing, no, none of the other theories even begins to work. Um, so he acknowledges that, but, and then acknowledges it in the way it's like, as if he's invented it. He doesn't mention that, <laughs> doesn't mention algish doesn't mention uh, Elaine at all. He's just suddenly discovered that uh, wading in, 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 on riverbanks would be the only logical solution to getting bipedal. But then, of course, somehow or other, he manages to say that uh, human females don't form alliances. And he manages to maintain his picture of, I mean, partly, I think, because he, he did his field work with, with um, Jane Goodall at Gombe Stream. He assumes that our ancestors, when we, as we were coming human, as we were developing hand axes, as we were developing cooking fire and so on, we were still behaving like common chimpanzees with, with extreme forms of male dominance, thanks to this rule which he's invented for himself, which is that human females do not form alliances. 
Um, so uh, I kind of that's in a way it. Um, I think I could now share screen and show you if I can find find the um, the PowerPoint. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so now um, I mean I'm just all I'm doing now is going over what I've said with with a little bit of um, documentation, not too much of course. I'm sure you don't need too much. But females drive primate social evolution. Um, these are very you know, senior figures, Lyndon Force, Froberg, and, and Charles Nunn. Um, and the, I'll just read the first bit. Within and across species of primates, the number of males in primate groups is correlated with the number of females. This correlation may arise owing to ecological forces operating on females, with subsequent competition among males for access to groups of females. So that's just saying that where the, what the females do determines what the males are going to do. Um, and um, on the right here, which I'm going to see if I can move it a bit because, um, sorry, how does this move on along? Can you see? Uh, I was saying, well, males go where the females are. See in the red, the red thing at the bottom there, it's slightly covered by the, um, the pictures of all of us. But anyway, that's the males go where the females are. That's the best basic logic. And what I'm saying is that's the that's general rule for all primates. One would have thought that that must therefore logically apply to the transition to bipedal hominins and eventually to, um, to you know to, to modern humans. Um, but as but as if, as long as you do okay. Now this is this is what they, this is Robert Foley and Clive Gamble. They're saying that, and this is underlined here, the most significant divergence of these differences between us and living apes relate to our social behaviour and its underlying cognition, which is fair enough, of course. Um, but then now this is a diagram where they show you how they manage to turn everything upside down. So the top there is that uh, is this what they call this causal, this cascade of causality. So the distribution of resources um, shapes the distribution of females. So the females go wherever their the food is. So the distribution of resources controls how the females and their reproductive potential. In other words, the fact that males can only um, perpetuate the genes by finding females uh, so that, that the resources distribution just um, determines the distribution of females which then in turn de determines how the males um, uh, distribute themselves and what they're saying is that um, that gets turned completely upside down if the males control the distribution of resources so that bottom line males control distribution of resources goes up to the top because the distribution of resources is, is itself determined by males. Can you see what's going on there? So, and I'll just read out the bottom here, figure one. The classical model of socioecology, in which owing to the different costs of male and female reproduction, females are more strongly influenced by resources, males more strongly in, uh, um, influenced by the distribution of females. That's Wrangham. During the course of human social evolution, the increased ability of males to control resources has led to a closure of the cascade model with males exerting control over female distribution through the control over resources. So that's how they're justifying turning upside down what any zoologist, any primatologist, any behavioral ecologist um, would expect, because males control the distribution of resources. So here is a bonobo on the edge of a river, and it's found lots of food there. And here is one doing Algis's stuff. It's starting to move upright as it's looking for food. And here they found some nice food, two of them. They're all getting on quite well, plenty of food around. Uh, here we are. I'm not just gonna go through some of these, <laughs> some of these pictures because they just make the point so beautifully. So, I mean, our theory or Algis's theory, which is of course my theory, is, it's not a theory. It is what happens when chimps get the chance. <laughs> If you then why would those chimps go to the hot tri savanna when they can find this kind of stuff? Um, so you're you're holding on to a branch um, while keeping yourself upright. Of course, we need to remember these 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 are chimps, common chimps. They've only been separated from common chimps for a million years. They can't swim, by the way. They can't swim. They're drowned. So this this chimp here is in danger of drowning if it lets go of that branch because they can't swim. But they can, of course, wade. Um, I'm just going through them, and and what's what's remarkable is that the, is the way in which the degree to which they're all getting on pretty well. I mean, it's not quite true. There's there's not they're not egalitarian. They're not anarchists. They're not you know communistic. I mean, they're, they're, there's quite a lot of conflict and competition going along, and particularly among the males, there's quite a vertical 
uh, political hierarchy. There's definitely a, a ranking order between the males, but, but the point is that the females are dominant in general um, over the males. And perhaps I should just say, in terms of all these ideas about primitive warfare, warfare being you know, natural because chimpanzees practice warfare, I just say this while this picture's here. I haven't quite got a picture of this particular thing, but when I, what's amazing, and this comes from the re recent research, a wonderful lot of work by Brian Hare, and, and, but also others. When a group of bonobos, they do have kind of territorial boundaries, but when a group of bonobos come to the edge of, a, of, their, of their territory, what happens is that the males kind of get a bit scared and anxious, and they try to sort of corral the females from crossing over into the neighboring territory. And the reason is because they've got a strong feeling um, that, quote, their females are going to kind of um, not be very faithful and are going to start um, inviting sex with the, with the enemy uh, males. And so, so the, the, on our side, this side, the, um, the, the males try to exert a bit of control, but usually it doesn't work. And what happens is that the females break over, link up with the, quote, enemy females, form an alliance against their own males in order to have sex with the enemy males. Now, that is and I mean, that's all documented in, 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 by Brian Hare and his colleagues. And I can, I'll show you in a moment just the cover of their, of their book, the book I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. But it's like, it's like reverse warfare. It's like you make friends with the enemy and you fight against your own, you know, you're the males that are trying to dominate you. And in order to overthrow those dominant males on your, on your side of the boundary, you, you link up with, with the, quote, enemy females and form a kind of cross-territorial um, coalition. And, I, and of course, I mean, we, we can just go on forever with these pictures. I mean, mostly, whenever they can, the bonobos are splashing around in water, play fighting with the water, enjoying themselves in the water. This is a, a, a probably not quite such a playful fight. This is probably one male attacking another in the in the water. And I'm just making the point that wherever you go in that region, there's there's rivulets and streams and you know and, and wetlands and marshes. That's the environment in which these um, common chimps, the, what used to be common chimps, move. And it leads to uh, very strong female coalitions, and it reverses the, the, the political dynamic of male domin dominance, which all the textbooks still assume is part of human heritage. Yeah, just, it just reverses it. So, um, and this is, you know, okay, so I think that we've got to the last, last of these pictures. Now, this is the book, Bonobos. Unique in Mind, Brain and Behavior, edited by Brian Hare and Chinya Yamamoto. I really recommend this book. It's a beautiful, well-illustrated book with about 12 or so, 13 lovely chapters. And on the right there, I think it's for some reason, it's, 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 it's hidden by our, our pictures, at least it is on my, my screen. It's the offspring defense hypothesis, how bonobo babies dominate um, the, 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 the social group. It is Kara, is it Kara Walker, I believe, and, uh, and Brian Hare. And this is there, this is, um, the, the, Brian and his partner's um, popular book, Survival of the Friendliest, Understanding Our Origins and Rediscovering Our Common Humanity. Um, so, I mean, the rest of it, this is, this is just kind of, yeah, that's, that's, that's my stuff. Okay, well, that, that's it, everybody. Um, I've, I've done. I'm going <laughs> to cancel this now and uh, see if I can find um, where we are. I've got to stop sharing screen, haven't I? Okay, well, that's well, it. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That Wonderful and and such beautiful beautiful pictures. I love those photos. Well, I didn't take the pictures. I nicked the pictures, of course. <laughs> but, but they were fantastic. Yeah. So so thank you very much. Before I open up for questions for everybody, I've got a couple of my own that I want to ask. I, I just wanted to uh, ask you um, about language because you've written so much about language, and I'm 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 curious as to uh, how you think that fits into here? You know, may, maybe for those of uh, the pe of people who, who are not familiar with your sex strike theory and the the idea of uh, cultural origins, maybe if, if you could just say a few words about that, how language origins and human cultural origins fits into this model of a rich uh, diet, uh, which, which would then uh, allow females to have this. Uh, these these bonds between them. It's Thank you very much. Thank you, August. I'm glad you asked that question because I, I was hoping somebody would. Because it's you know, I'm I'm rather interested in bringing all these different things together, including kinship and religion and ritual and mythology and language and everything else, and not just stopping at a certain point. Um, you know. So yes. Okay. So I mean, there's no there's no doubt in my mind that breath control 
was a fundamental prerequisite, at least for spoken language, obviously not for sign language or gestural language. So breath control is important and that, and that has to be a, a kind of a pre-adaptation, except that of course we know that you never get in evolution, you never get adaptation for some purpose in the future. The, the adaptation has to be for what's going on right now. And of course, breath control is just obvious because under the water, when it's splashing around, you need to, you need to control your breath. So we would, we would expect uh, um, chimpanzees who've got used to being in the water, especially if they start diving and swimming, which the bonobos haven't got around to doing, um, you'd expect more breath control. But having said that, I, I, I don't at all want to collude with the idea that somehow the reason we've got language is because of water and because of breath control. And it, I mean, it's, obviously it's true that, you know, cetaceans and dolphins and other aquatic mammals, they, they use sound more than, than gesture. But I mean, you know, I'm interested in language and language is much more than making sounds. That's one point. It's got words and grammar. It's all quite difficult to work it, work it all out. Um, and anyway, of course, language doesn't have to be spoken. It can be signed. And uh, in fact, if we've got insofar as humans seem to have a almost a grammar instinct in the sense that a, a little child acquires the grammar of its natal language with an appetite, uh, as if it's kind of born with that appetite for getting around this complex theoretical structure, which any, any language is in terms of its grammar. So I'm just saying breath control doesn't get to those aspects of what language is. Now, the critical thing is this, is that language is beyond the pale, it's off the scale compared with anything else which any other creature in the, in the natural world does. And language isn't for moving and navigating around in reality, it's for navigating within virtual reality. And there has to be virtual reality to navigate around in, in order for language to even be thinkable. I'm going to, I'm not going to answer too long, it'll take up far too much time. The critical thing is this, animal signals are reliable, their body language, and the receiver of the signal needs to know for sure that that signal is kind of true. It's, it's rooted in reality, rooted in the body, rooted in the situation, rooted in the emotions, whatever, but it's, it's, there's no way um, a, ch a common chimp would know that a signal was like a food call or something was, was fake and yet celebrate the fact that it's a fake. It's, essentially animals, because, of, because they live in a Darwinian world, are on alert for trickery and deception. And then that makes language not just difficult to explain, but actually it makes it, in some sense, theoretically impossible, because language isn't just capable of lying. From a chimpanzee standpoint, every single thing we say is a lie to start with, because it's not, it's not, it's not real. So when we say words are cheap, uh, you know, why, would, why would a creature that's previously de depended on the kinds of signals which can't be faked, when we call them hard to fake signals, in, in the human case, crying, sobbing, screaming, yelling, all the things we do, you know, as, as kind of body language. Um, when we don't trust each other, if, if, if two of us have robbed a bank and, I, and we meet together afterwards and I'm not sure where my mate stashed the money and I think he's lying to me, I, I won't care what he says. I'll be looking at his eyes, see if they shift a bit, looking at his, his beads of sweat coming up on his forehead or somewhere. So I'm just saying, when you're not sure, you, rely, you, you force the signaler back on signals which they can't fake and, and chimpanzees and actually all primates and in fact all mammals because they live in a Darwinian world, not a sort of morally regulated world, that's what they do. Now, just I'm trying to be brief, if you think about mistrust among, say, chimpanzees, what's the root of the mistrust? The root of it is sex. So the males will start to will play fight when they're young, and then, and then the hormones start to kick in as they, as they, as they get a, a bit older. And as soon as sex becomes um, an issue, those males won't be play fighting, they'll be fighting. And it suddenly becomes losing a game, which you have to know how to lose if you're playing. But once sex enters the scene, you can't afford to lose. Otherwise you may not have any offspring and the males then start fighting for real. And under those circumstances, you're not gonna get language. How are you going to get to a situation where sufficient trust prevails for language to even be possible? Well, somehow the females, have got to make playing that male game of using violence to get sex. The females themselves have got to develop strategies to make that no longer a playable game. Now, of course, those females won't be developing those strategies in order to allow language to happen. They'll be developing those strategies in their own immediate interest, much the way that bonobo females do. But bonobo females just don't like being pushed around and they don't like their babies being threatened, so they form coalitions. 
what happened with humans is very different. We're no way were we ever bonobos. But the critical thing is this, it's about, it's about leverage and bargaining. Um, the, the, the series I mentioned earlier, Clive Gamble, uh, Robert Foley and so on, they, they, they kind of say, well, the males, because they're out in the savannah with this meat or this, uh, this marrow fat or whatever, they've got some leverage, they can bargain with something. And then they say, the poor females, well, what have they got to bargain with? They, they've got gathered food, but they can't bargain with gathered food because they can't withdraw it. Um, because, <laughs> you know, anyone can get that same food. So you've got nothing to bargain with. And we're there forgetting something, sex. Males want sex. And females who've got formed coalitions, they've got something to bargain with because a badly behaved, behaved male is not gonna get any sex. You just withdraw it. You just, you just, you just offer sex to males who are being nice to you. Um, that, that's the kind of survivor of the friendliest <laughs> basic argument. So when I say sex strike, it's not, a, I, I, I sometimes get accused of, Chris Knight's got a theory, it's called sex strike. And sorry, it's not a theory, it's what happens. Among hunter-gatherers, immediate return hunter-gatherers, those that don't store food, women live, at least initially, with mum, therefore with sisters, and a male who tries to get sex without bringing back any meat, he's out on his neck. You know, that, that is, that's called bride service. You, a man never gain, and this is, again, this is so little known. You don't have to do hunter-gatherer research, but talk to any hunter-gatherer specialist. A man never gains conjugal rights in his wife. There's no such thing as conjugal rights. If you, if you start misbehaving, if you, if you don't make yourself useful, if you're not a generous, thoughtful provider of your partner and her kids, all her kids, by the way, no matter who the dad was, um, you'll, you'll find yourself up against her mum, her sisters, her brothers, and you're out. And that's, you know, that's sex strike. So, and so what I'm saying is until you've got that capacity of, for females to resist being bullied, you're going to get males playing the only game in town, which is to fight each other for access to females. And under those circumstances, you're going to get kind of a constant semi-civil war within the group, you know, and under those circumstances, no one's going to trust each other very much. And language is just, okay, it might be a good idea, but forget it, it won't happen. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Chris. Now I've got, I've got a question uh, from Malga Jata, because she's actually booked this question about four days ago. So I want to ask her first, and then I've got Gareth, uh, who's got a comment to make. So. Uh, Margaret Jata, next, please. Uh, the question actually was, uh, I wanted some comments, and the question really was, is do you believe in, in the social division uh, of labor in very early humans? Because I, I have to say, I don't. Yeah. I've seen skeletons, for example, in Stockholm, there's a, a skeleton of a, obviously a huntress, and very, very late. So, okay, so well, I, let, I would... let Chris answer, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> sorry. sorry, that's my enthusiasm. <laughs> we, we, need, we need to distinguish two things conceptually. One's which sex drives evolution, and that's quite separate from which sex is politically dominant. So the, the idea that, that, that females drive evolution applies right across the board, as you've just said, to not just primates, but all mammals. But that doesn't mean that all mammals are female dominant or even egalitarian, because common chimps, there's no question, they're very male dominated, but it's, it's female strategies which determine that they are male dominated. So it's female chimps dispersing, which generates the dominance of the males. And when females under different ecological conditions, don't disperse, but aggregate and form coalitions, then you get a, a much more uh, gender egalitarian um, political dynamic. So I, I don't want, I mean, it's obviously, you're, you're right, elephants and, and, and dolphins and so many, <laughs> so many, so many creatures um, are not just you know, female driven in terms of their, the, the way their, their, their social dynamics may, may change over time, but they're, they're largely female dominant anyway. But I just want to say chimpanzees really are male dominated. And there's no reason why, you know, why, why humans in the past may not have been male dominated. It's just that, that where they, again, it's another explanation, another whole thing, but it's just where, where males dominated over females in human evolution, a number of critical things which needed to happen wouldn't have happened. I, I, haven't got, I haven't got time to go through all of these things, of course, but I mean, everyone should know the, cri the critical contribution made in the last 15 years to human evolutionary theory is um, Sarah Hurdy's marvelous work. Sarah Hurdy being a sociobiologist, not just a sociobiologist, she's probably the leading founder of sociobiology where humans are concerned. So, you know, so, so I mean, so it's, Please don't knock sociobiology. Sociobiology is wonderful stuff because it, it brings out the reasons for conflict 
and competition. I am a sociobiologist. As I said earlier, because we all got attacked for all kinds of ridiculous reasons by the Marison people, we, we started calling ourselves behavioral ecologists, um, that genes are designed to replicate themselves. And, it, and if you're a female, you replicate your genes in a different way from if you're a male. Um, so, 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 I mean, I don't know, that's, that's, that, that's basically it. I mean, a lot of issues raised there. Um, sexual division of labor, I, I'm sorry, there's, there's no, absolutely no question. Anyone who knows the first thing about hunters and gatherers knows that women absolutely do not want the males to tell them, go and hunt your own antelope. You know, I mean, <laughs> the males have got to make themselves useful somehow. And the females refuse sex to any male who approaches them without meat. That's essentially what goes on. And now, of course, you can see, can't you, that if, if under the conditions of a, a general female collective action to, de to deprive anyone of sex until the, the hunt's successful, you can see, why, can't you, why if one young woman wanted to go and join the males and have some sex and have some fun, how she'd be breaking that action and, and, and all her sisters and mothers and, and, and partners would be furious with her. You know, it's like a one out, all out. If you're going to try and de deprive the males of sex, all the females are going to be in it together, which is why you don't just get a sort of general tendency for females not to hunt among hunter-gatherers, but generally speaking, females refuse to hunt because that's that's the job of the sex, which doesn't do a lot of other work. I mean, you know, females have got enough, enough on their plate with pregnancy and nursing and child and all the rest of it. And, and the males are biologically like the ledger sex, and from the female point of view, make those males make themselves useful if they want sex. And, and the way they do that is by hunting. So the answer to your question, is there a sexual division of labor? Absolutely, yes. And it was a fundamental liberation for females to get those males to do useful work for them. <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, so Gareth, uh, you, uh, Gareth, have you got a point? And then I'm going to open it to anyone else who wants to say something. Uh, literally five seconds. Just to sum up this wonderful talk, what I'm getting is that and woman created man, not in her own image, but to her own specifications. <laughs> my, wife's, my wife says it's very much a work in progress. <laughs> Absolutely right. Woman created man. It's, it's, called the domestic, it's called the domestication hypothesis. And even Wrangham um, talks about domestication as the, as the secret of human evolution with our gracility a reduced faces, a reduced canines and all that stuff. But Rangham thinks that males somehow manage to domesticate themselves by, by, by inventing capital punishment um, because, because females can't possibly be imagined to have done a damn thing. But of course, you're quite right. We, yeah. we are a domesticated species. Which sex domesticated us, the female? Yes. Absolutely. That's excellent. Or they try it. I also agree it's work in progress. We're not that domesticated and we're seeing some of the consequences uh, in the world's horrendous politics today with these with, and, 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 and men have been ruling the world for about, what, five, six thousand years and they made a right mess of it and still making an even, even bigger mess of it today. <clears throat> well, she can't even get me to pick my socks up yet, so it'll be a while. <laughs> Thanks, Gareth. So, there's somebody, uh, I'm going to open up. Okay, Leslie, do you want to have a, a question or you want to make a point? Yes, thanks very much. That was just fantastic. Really, really loved the talk. Very, you know, full of admiration. And um, the photos that you showed us were so beautiful and so compelling. I'd just like to hear your view of why this theory hasn't been accepted by the wider anthropological society. Well, thank you. That's great. Uh, well, if you look at the history of science, the further the focus is away from us and our issues and problems and, and passions, um, the more likely you are to find the scientists managing to agree with each other. So that's so the furthest away you can possibly get is to go to um, the distant stars and galaxies. And, and there's a reason why science begins there, because when it's distant stars and galaxies, you know, that's, you, can, you can sort of reach agreement about what, you know, what, what's, what's going on. So science begins with astronomy. And then the nearer and the nearer and the nearer it gets, the more political passions are aroused because it's, about, it's increasingly kind of about ourselves. And then when politics gets in the way, science is always um, the victim. So, I mean, it may be that Galileo didn't want to be doing politics, but, but when he said the earth is round and it moves, but the powers that be consider that a huge political threat. <laughs> Um, and so um, he was, uh, as we know, um, punished. Um, and of course, right through the whole history of science, we find similar 
examples. Uh, so the, the, in some ways, the founder of social science um, was Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, with his famous um, ringing declaration. Um, man was born free and everywhere he is in chains. And of course, that's, that was one of the <laughs> factors that sparked the French Revolution. Um, and, uh, but in, in a way, he was right. I mean, it's the, the kind of chains of monarchs and various other things going on in, in, in recent his, his history were, were not chains that we were subjected to when, when human society first um, emerged. Charles Darwin, of course, wanted to come out with his theory of evolution by natural selection, but he was terrified of publishing in case he was um, found to um, be, be inciting atheists and, and, and radicals in the period before 1848 and before everything started settled, settling down. Um, and, and we can go on, you know, I mean, so this, but the closer science gets to us, um, the more likely we are to find these uh, horrendous disputes. I, I don't think, I don't think we can avoid politics. But what is important is to avoid politics, having anything to do, to do with shaping science. It's to me, politics to be any use to any of us needs to be shaped by genuine science genuine the great thing about science is it's an international language um, you can't just pull rank you, as soon as you put forward a theory everybody tries to pull you down it's rather like being in a hunter-gatherer camp as soon as you say something or and you know, everyone will be trying to sort of pull you down because they don't want you to get above yourself so i'm very much in, fa in favor of science but of course science needs itself to be to a large extent turned upside down because far too much it's the preserve of, of corporations and states prioritizing their own agendas. And the last thing they want to hear, these people, is that human language, culture, civilization, you know, morality, everything else was born in a revolution, a social revolution led by women. And even if that's just a fact, just like it's the fact that the earth is round and it does move, the powers that be can't cope with that fact. It, it's like science has come up with the wrong answer. And from their point of view, when science comes out with the wrong answer, like it, like, like, rather like with climate change, it's kind of the wrong answer as far as the oil corporations are concerned, then these people will do all they can to fight back and put their own wretched politics above science. I think, I think science needs to be what it should be, which is a genuinely internationalist, accountable, collectivist form of knowledge making where no one's in charge and where you just need to go wherever it takes you. Um, and, then, and then that would be truly revolutionary. But of course, the theory I'm putting forward has been fought tooth and nail from the very beginning. Although I've had a lot of support, of course. I mean, you know, it's it's, it's kind of we're kind of main, in some ways mainstream with our theory. I mean, we're very much in touch with and close to Sarah Hervey's um, theory, of course, that our large brains are thanks not not just to the good food we were eating, that you know, the, the lipids and so on, but very much to do with the fact of mothers and others you, you couldn't you couldn't have these large brain babies if mothers were left to single mothers the way chimps are you need to have support from your sisters and your mum uh, in order to be able to afford the very costly thing which a large brain is um, with all the problems of you know slow de you know slow developing and all, all, a hugely increased amount of childcare required and all the rest of it so our theory is linked to sarah heard is sarah heard has come around to our view about living with mum she's a friend of ours uh, and sarah heard herself partly because she steers clear of the later phases of human evolution because it's not really her field but sarah hurdy has opened the door for the theory that i'm putting forward along with um, warner finnegan jerome lewis Kimmel power ian watts we're quite a team now and we are you know we're, we're, we're almost sort of mainstream although not, that doesn't, it doesn't mean we're you know it's obviously it'll always be controversial even if it's evidently true and, I'm, and to me it's just it's a no it's a no-brainer that, that the existing theories are hugely politically biased i think i think you are mainstream on the language side as well you know that that's i mean all of those books that you've been contributing to are really well well received by everyone as far as i can tell yeah, is there anyone true. else that's got a question before because we are I'm, I'm just conscious of the time it's 9 14 we're supposed to we're kind of supposed to be winding up but maybe time for one more anyone who hasn't asked a question would like to ask one or Francesca? Well, not, I don't know if I've got a question, but um, it's made me think, uh, although this isn't really what Chris has been talking about in the same time frame, I think, but um, a few things that have pointed me towards the possibility of 
having a much more matriarchal history, if you like, in human evolution. Um, there are, of course, the Venus figurines from the sp stretching over many millennia all over the world. They always depict huge, enormous, breasted, thighs, uh, stomach yeah. women. Um, that could be seen as a culture that was centered around the icon of a, a female or a grandmother, a matriarch, as a sort of something to idolize in a way, possibly. We don't know enough about it. But the oldest is presumed to be about half a million years old and possibly uh, crafted by Homo erectus. Um, and it just kept going, you know, for thousands of years. So it seems to be substantial. Women being fatter, especially after menopause, you know, that's all the grandmother hypothesis and so on. It's all associated. And another thing that I've recently read is how the fusion of the HS, the second chromosome in humans, as opposed to uh, chimpanzees, uh, genetically seems to be associated with a situation where there were very few males and many females. Um, okay, I don't really understand genetics so well or how that all works, but uh, that's what they're saying. Less competition among males may have brought about the fusion of the chromosomes, um, making us unique compared to other primates. Um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, on both on both counts. Um, I mean. If you want, if you're interested in my stuff, uh, read my book, um, Blood Relations. There's a, there's a whole chapter on the figurines, um, and there's no question that you're right about that. There, there, there was a religion. I'm reading it at the moment. Sorry, I haven't finished it yet, but I've sort of been scrolling. I it. see. <laughs> you'll, soon, you'll soon get to the Venus figurines. So you're quite right, and, and it, so you're right across, right across the whole of Europe. And as we came out of Africa, there's no, there's no question that we had kind of one system of um, cosmology and ritual centered around these these matriarchal, uh, as you say, um, icons um, and, and, being, and being large and fat. And I mean, obviously for hunters and gatherers that we, we know from Stephen, Stephen's um, book and from, you know, the survival of the fattest, for hunters and gatherers being fat is a sign of huge satisfaction <laughs> and, and attraction. Um, so the, the, this, the, and so, and you had, of course, chains of, you must have had chains of connection right across Europe for those very similar figurines to be stretching right across all borders that you, you didn't you just don't get sort of territorialism you don't get a sort of particular sort of range of imagery in southern france from in austria from in you know in germany where i mean quite clearly you had chains of connections stretching across the landscape um with with females at the center um and then just okay another theme in the book um again and again this is standard um sociobiology or behavioral ecology is where females synchronize their cycles so if you have ovarian synchrony with all females in a group or right or maybe across a landscape synchronizing the fact of being sexually available so if it was estrus you do every all the, if it, I mean, this would have been a long time ago when when when, when maybe ancestral human females had a kind of estrus period but if everyone's demanding sex at the same time either seasonally at the same time or once a month in, in connection with the moon at the same time what that does, it makes it impossible for an alpha male to monopolize a harem. An alpha male monopolizing a harem, he has to, he has to be, he has to kind of, he can only, he can, he can only manage it if the females come into receptivity in turn. In other words, if they are out of sequence with each other, out of sync with each other, if they stagger their periods of fertility. But if all the females in a group synchronize, um, then the male, one male can't cope. And that, what that means is that multiple males come into the breeding system. So at, all males have now got a good chance of having sex. And that should address the question you're asking about the, 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 that, that genetic change, where you have a substantial reduction in male competition. Obviously, if one male can have 12 or so females, as you, have, as you, as, as you might get with some of the baboons, and to some extent with common chimps, that means that sex is going to be quite scarce and males are going to fight like hell for a share, because not everyone is going to get a lot of sex. But as soon as, the, if the females are synchronizing their cycles, it, either, either seasonally or some kind of convergence of lunar and solar synchrony with a seasonal synchrony refined by, by synchrony with the moon, which is actually what I think must have happened, then of course, you're gonna get far less aggression between males because everyone's gonna have sex. So, you know, why fight for it? Thank you. One more, anyone else who hasn't asked a question? Otherwise, I'm, I think I'm going to wrap it up because we've taken up a, a lot of your time there, Chris. So thanks. 
I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop recording now and thank you very much. So let me just uh, say thank you very much, Chris, for a great talk. It's been fascinating. There was so much more thank you, Chris. to talk about, <laughs> but I, you had to come draw the line somewhere. So thank you very much. Okay, okay thank you. Cheers. Thank you so much.